<laughs> we just talked about frill sharks and how they live under an ocean, literal, but we live under an ocean of air. So look up frill sharks on YouTube and you'll find one that was caught in Japan some 10 years ago or so. Pretty interesting, it's worth seeing. All right, Pascal's Paradox. This one's kind of interesting. You guys know this, but uh, maybe it hasn't been described to you this way. Pascal's Paradox is the idea that the pressure under a surface of fluid depends only on the depth beneath that fluid where the pressure is measured. At least, this only occurs though when the fluid is static, when it's not moving. If there's motion of the fluid, significant motion, the pressure can vary. In fact, I've often thought, well, you know, why aren't all vessels, all sea-going vessels, simply submarines? So they're already sunk, <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't have to worry about sinking because they're designed to be sunk. Uh, and then you go through storms with no problem, right? Kind of like the Nautilus. Well, actually, as the fluid above moves, there will be pressure variations within the water. And so it's because of the, the ocean currents as well as waves piling on top. So anyway, but in fluid statics, the amount of pressure uh, that is experienced depends only on the depth beneath the fluid. It doesn't depend on the shape of the container, and that seems strange. It's because our intuition is off a little bit. We like to think of this surface as being angled, so it shouldn't have as much pressure, but, but it does. Okay? And the shape doesn't matter. What does matter is the fluid type. If we have a swimming pool like this, let's say we had a swimming pool shaped like this, and we put mercury down here, this is the death trap for the guests we don't like. Hey, dive there, Joe. Okay? <laughs> You really don't want to get in contact with that mercury, but if you did, the pressure at the bottom of the mercury section would be higher than the pressure at the bottom of, say, the water section. Why? Because the mercury is more dense. Okay, so the, dense, the pressure would increase quicker in the mercury than it does in the water because of the density difference. But the shape of the container that it's in would have nothing to do with that phenomenon. Okay? The pressure at A, B, C, D, E, F, and G would all be the same. The pressure at I would be greater than those, and the pressure at H would be more still. All right, so unfortunately, the way your author talks about this, he says P equals rho GH. That's the way he usually writes it. And I don't like that because we usually take a coordinate system as positive in the upward direction. So think about a submarine for a minute. If the submarine moves in the negative y direction or the negative z direction, what happens? Does this pressure on it increase or decrease? Increase. Increases, right? So we've got this, this negative relationship where a decrease in position, a coordinate position, uh, corresponds with an increase in pressure. So I prefer this form of the equation. This is the only thing I'll really ask you to add. To, well, no, it's not. There's a few other things I'll ask you to write down and add. But for your notes or in your book somewhere, please write this down. Delta P, the change in pressure, equals negative rho G delta H. So that this is clear. So if there is a negative change in height, delta H will be negative. A negative times a negative is a positive, and we'll see an increase in pressure from the equation. So P equals rho G H, I don't really like because it's not. It doesn't help you remember it properly. So delta P equals negative rho G delta H. We can talk about barometers as well because uh, what you notice from that equation is that the denser the fluid, the faster the pressure changes as you change elevation. The higher the acceleration of gravity, the faster pressure changes as you move down in a fluid. Um, but we can use this equation to figure out what's happening with a barometer. When you have a, if I were to take a tube full of mercury, right, I take a test tube and I pour a bunch of mercury in it, and then I just turn it upside down, what do you think would happen? It'd start floating. It'd start filling, it'd just, yeah, floating on the floor, right? <laughs> it would spill out all over the floor. But if you take a container like this and you do the same thing and turn the, the test tube over into the vat of mercury, it does not come out. Some of you may have pets and may have one of the two liter bottle feeding things, right? Well, liquid is for, for water, right? You screw a two-liter bottle in that's full, you screw it upside down, you turn it over, and it doesn't leak. Why? Well, remember the air pressure that crushed that railroad car? That same air pressure can hold the weight of the mercury up in the tube, right? Think about it. As the mercury tries to go down, there's a vacuum up here. But there's pressure down here. So the pressure pushes down on the mercury and actually forces the mercury up in the tube. Now, one way to look at this, we can look at it with that delta P equals negative rho G delta H. And if we're careful and make sure that the delta P is a final minus initial that matches a final minus initial height, in other words, the first pressure has to correspond to the first height and the second pressure has to correspond to the second height, 
then we can find something out about barometers. So let's start at this point. That'll be our first point. The atmospheric pressure here is P atmosphere, and the height, we'll take this to be our reference, so that's a height of zero. When we move to the other point, well then we move to a point that has pretty much a perfect vacuum, not exactly, but close enough, and the height at that point is H, so these two match also. When we simplify and get rid of the zeros, what we find is that the atmospheric pressure equals rho GH. In other words, if we know the density of the fluid rho, we know the acceleration of gravity, basically how hard the Earth is pulling down on this, and the height of the mercury column, we can actually calculate atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure does vary a bit throughout the day and with the seasons. And so um, it's a good uh, weather tool because you can predict some things using atmospheric pressure. In any case, the part we're interested in is the fact that there's a, an ocean of air around this literally pushing the mercury up into the tube. Compound manometers. Have you guys seen compound manometers before? Where at? Fluid mechanics. Fluid mechanics. Okay, so Professor Cooley probably enjoys this one also. We both love to teach torture something students. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we deal with this? Well, here's the way I want you to deal with it. It's really simple. You'll start off and you'll say the pressure at point A is equal to the pressure at point B plus whatever pressure there is by going down, H3, plus whatever, the, whatever pressure there is by moving down in the mercury and then back up, okay? So there'll be an increase, 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 decrease, decrease, decrease in pressure. And all that really matters is this height because since we have the same fluid here, the pressure on this side is the same as the pressure on this side. Okay. So there would be an in pressure at B plus H5, this height, multiplied by the density of the water acceleration of gravity, plus H4 times the density of mercury acceleration of gravity. Now we're over here. Then we have to move up in water. So will the pressure increase or decrease? Decrease. Decrease because we're moving up in this liquid. So minus H3 multiplied by G and the density of water, rho. And then if we continue up in the water, the pressure would decrease, but it's going to increase back again to the same as it was when we were over here. So we may as well just jump to the other side. The pressure will continue to increase in the mercury. We can jump to the other side and then decrease in the oil. How would we write that down? We do it like this. The pressure at A is equal to the pressure at B plus some pressure due to this water column, H5, plus more pressure due to H4, the mercury column, minus some pressure due to that water column, where we're moving up in it, plus some pressure due to this mercury column, not this mercury column, but this one. See how we're going from here to over here? So some pressure is added there. And then finally, minus the pressure relief by moving up in the oil up to point A. That would be the pressure at point A. Okay. So this is a simple equation that uh, you can write very easily with compound manometers. I think I've got a compound manometer problem on the homework for you. But you're just simply writing uh, increase in pressure as you move down and decreases in pressure as you move up in the various fluids. Questions, comments? You doing okay? All right, let's see if there's any other interesting videos. Yeah, there are some interesting videos. We should watch another one. We've succeeded <laughs> in making it through um, a set of slides, so we deserve a video. Uh, it's related to your project. And I'm going to assign project groups uh, randomly. Um, so I will do that and give you those assignments next time. You, you'll also be able to look on Blackboard and see it. But there's actually two interesting videos that um, I think, I, well, there's actually a couple I'd like to show you. Uh, I'm not a big renewables guy. Most people that teach thermodynamics are. Um, I am much more interested in practical sources of energy. I like renewables. I think they're neat. Uh, I just understand that we usually use concentrated sources of, of energy. That's what we like to use. That's why, um, that's why uh, nuclear power is, is such an interesting thing. It's because the, the power source is super concentrated. And then you got the problems like Chernobyl. <laughs> That's a, that's a problem. I used to really be a fan of nuclear power instead of, until I started watching some of the disaster videos and how they came about and realized that as human beings we will always make mistakes. So that doesn't bode well for all the atomic weapons we have. 
As you know, the atomic weapons have already been dropped on our country on accident. They didn't go off. We dropped them on ourselves on accident. Thank God. Or I, th I forgot where it was. Massachusetts, I think it was. Wouldn't even be there. Georgia. Now. Georgia. There's been a couple of them. It's kind of scary. But anyway. Um, yeah, so, well, some nuclear weapons have not been found on submarines that have gone down. So, anyway. Do you need to stop for you? What's that? Do you need to stop for you? Yeah, I'll have to stop it for you. Well, I might not have to for this one because I don't know if Voith would really care. But thank you. Yeah, I'll do that in a moment. I was going to show you a few things that I think are actually practical. I'm not a real big fan of wind energy. Um, in particular, I'm not a fan of wind turbines that aren't very far off the ground. I know they look like they're very far off the ground. But they're really not by comparison to how far you can go. I do like some of these ideas, so I'll show them to you. And if you're watching the video, just pause or just stop the video and uh, especially watch this one: uh, kite turbine uh, and ocean energy. Those two are really interesting. And then a little bit later, we'll, we'll look at these perpetual motion machine videos because these perpetual motion machine videos actually relate to your project where you're going to try in a team to build one of the fraudulent um, perpetual motion machines and try to make it work. If you can. Okay. If you succeed, I'm going to be very proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> no one has ever succeeded. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I remember when I was uh, probably four or five years old, it was before kindergarten, my dad has always been into uh, recumbent bicycles. And anytime he saw someone riding one, especially back in the 80s, he would stop them and talk to them, and he was really excited about it. And, I remember he was talking to this one guy and, you know, interested in the bike, and the guy happened to have an electric motor on his bike. I was like, Dad, Dad, I got an idea, I got an idea. He's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, so after he gets done talking with the guy, he asks, well, okay, so what's your idea? And I said, well, Dad, he's got a motor on it. Why doesn't he put a generator on it, get it started, and let the motor drive the generator, and the generator drive the motor, and then he can go for free. Yeah, so. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right, so let's watch these videos, and we'll talk about them. Let's see what you think about them. 